Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You know, we always talk about the cross being the tool of torture, but we often forget about the nails that were driven through the hands and the feet of our Savior. Our, this morning, our topic is entitled, The Nails of the Cross, so please stay tuned. Sunday is always that special time for us to get into the Word of God. And we're glad that you've joined us this morning for the Game of the Bible presentation. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on the Give Me the Bible program. Good morning, friends, and welcome to Give Me the Bible. I'm Dan Manuel, and I'll be serving as your host this morning. And uh, we have a number of panelists that will be here this morning to share with you in uh, this lesson on the nails of the cross. You may have never really given a lot of consideration to what the Bible says in the book of John chapter 20. But when we think about those nails that were driven through the flesh of our Savior and our Lord, uh, the Bible teaches us many, many things that those nails represent and what Jesus really nailed down on the cross. So I hope you'll stay with us for the next few moments as we present this lesson on the nails of the cross. We're going to go first of all this morning to Perry Cowan. And Perry, I know that uh, those nails driven through the body of Jesus must have been painful as they would have been for us. But I know that in His great love, and his desire to save mankind. He was willing to give his life. And in reality, it manifests the great love of God for all of mankind, doesn't it? And what really happened when Jesus allowed those nails to be driven? What did it really nail down? Good morning, folks. We're grateful that you've tuned in to our program today. You know, Dan, one of the things that was nailed down by the nails, besides the hands and the feet of our Lord Jesus, was the faithfulness of God. That's directed by the words that we find in the Scripture. I want us to notice from the Bible uh, the, the ability of God and the dependability of God as it is given by uh, several passages. We're going to look first at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul said all of the promises of God are in Him, Him being Jesus Christ. All of God's promises are in Christ. As He was nailed on that cross, uh, He fulfilled promises that were made. Uh, in Romans chapter 4 and verse 21, He said, What He had promised, He was also able to perform. So that, you know, it's nailed down that, you know, if God says it, God will do it. Uh, God has never broken a promise. In Ephesians chapter 3, in the verse number 20, He said, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Don't, don't ever think that there's anything that God cannot do. With God, all things are possible. So we need to understand that, that, that these facts are nailed down uh, by those nails of the cross. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. God is able nothing that he is unable to do. The Hebrew writer said and, uh, concerning the faith of many, and then verse 11 focused upon Sarah. You remember Sarah was uh, 90 years old when God came to her and Abraham and said uh, that they were going to have a child. Well, by faith, Sarah received strength and she bore a child, even though she was past the normal age for childbearing, and, and the scripture there says, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Well, you know, when God makes a promise to you, judge him faithful that he will keep that promise. In Titus chapter 1 and, and verse 2, uh, Paul says that we should live in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. And that, that's uh, reiterated in the sixth chapter of Hebrews when the writer there said, for it is him possible for God to lie in that you know we might lay hold of the hope that is set before us. John chapter 3 says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. If you don't believe you will perish. We need to understand that these things are nailed down to be facts by God's word and by those nails. Dan. 
Thank you, Perry. Thank you very much for those timely thoughts. Now, not only do nails actually nail down something, but sometimes those nails are nails to close something as well. And so we're going to call on Randy Foreman right now to help us understand what, what Jesus closed when those nails were driven to his hands. Good morning, folks. Good morning, Dan. Thanks for having me on the program this morning. Yes, uh, the nails also closed the door of Judaism. We're no longer under the Old Testament system. That is the law of Moses. I'm going to read four scriptures, and because I believe that the Bible is its own best commentary, there will be little commentary. But listen as I read Colossians 2, 14, and Hebrews 9, 15. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now Hebrews 9. And for this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. The old law was our schoolmaster. It was our tutor to bring us to Christ. Listen to Galatians 3, 19 through 29. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the Scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, uh, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, were, did put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so nailed shut are the requirements of the old law. You know, and if we try to return to that which was voided, Scripture says in Galatians 5, 4, You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you are fallen from grace. Dan? Randy, thank you very much. And uh, we know according to the words of Christ that we have heard already this morning that that old law was really nailed to the cross and Jesus came to fulfill it. But we know that in the New Testament, and when we look back at the death of Christ on the cross, the nails also brought together a number of things that we want to look at throughout the program now. And we want to call on Mark Engel uh, to help us understand a few of those things, first of all, uh, that Christ nailed together. Mark? Well, Dan, I appreciate it, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to share this part of the lesson. You know, so many are confused today on what Jesus did uh, or what was accomplished through the nails uh, as they nailed his, his hands and his feet to the cross. So many people feel like they're on an island. It's just about how God uh, speaks to them in a personal relationship or how their Savior, uh, and, it, and it doesn't somehow include the members of the body of Christ. And here's where this lesson really needs to affect those uh, in that way because uh, it's essential to understand that the nails of the cross nailed together Christ and the church. It wasn't simply meant to be Christ and the individual Christian on a mountaintop experience without any need of the church. In fact, I think that uh, the Hebrew writer understood this as he wrote Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. He says, not forsaking the assembly or some are in the, are in the habit of doing, but all the more encouraging one another as you see that day drawing near. And so our worship is simply not about us and God, although that's a big part of it. It is also about the encouragement that we can be to one another. 
you know, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 12 and following talks to us about the importance of understanding that we're placed in the body by the Holy Spirit and we're given certain spiritual gifts to contribute to the body. There are no unimportant parts of the body of Christ. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Well, his church includes the members of the body of Christ, not simply one individual who has a relationship with God outside of that experience. And so as those nails were driven into the feet and the hands of Jesus, let us understand that it's not simply to give forgiveness of sins to the trespasser, but also to add them to the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 13, we're told that we're added to the church through our baptism. And so as we experience this, you know, we, there's a lot of social injustice out there and so many people can, can kind of remove themselves from a fellowship in the church and with that do whatever they want. And if you're familiar with the, the minor prophets, you understand that God will not accept our worship and then see his people commit social injustice against others. In fact, he said in Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, if you're preparing to offer your altar there and then remember your brother has something against you, first go and be reconciled to God, then come and prepare and give your offering to God. Dan, back to you. All right, thank you, Mark. And so we understand the importance of the church and the church being simply a support group it is the bride of Christ, and how wonderful it is to be a part of, of the church of Jesus our Lord. Now, not only did he nail together Christ and the church, but he also nailed together something else. And that something else is what our friend Chris Grota is going to address right now. Thanks, Dan. The nail that I want to drive home is that we are justified by his blood, Romans 5 and verse number 9. And uh, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 7, you know, John in, in his... Revelation in his vision talks to one of the elders up in heaven who asks, uh, who are these that are clothed in white robes? Well, white robes represent those that are pure, those that have been uh, forgiven of their sin. They're sinless because of the merits of Jesus Christ. And of course, uh, John identifies them. He says, you know who these people are. They're, they are those who have had their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. And thus they were made white. You know, over in 1 Peter chapter 1, 17 and 18, if you call God Father, uh, you conduct yourselves with fear. You were ransomed from the feudal ways of your ancestors. But not with silver and gold, he says, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And of course, John affirms over in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 7, he says, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ forgives us or cleanses us of our sins. And so that's point number one in all this, that uh, we are justified by the blood of Christ. But how is it that we appropriate the blood of Jesus Christ? This is the other nail in the discussion, and that is we come in contact with the blood of Christ through baptism. Now, let me show you this. Over in Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16, Ananias tells Paul, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and do what? Wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. You see over in Revelation 1 verse 5, He has loved us and He has freed us from our sins by His blood. But that blood is appropriated by baptism. Over in uh, Matthew 26, 27, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to His disciples and told them that this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. That same phrase, for the remission of sins, is found in Acts 2.38 when Peter on Pentecost said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. How is the remission of sins coming? It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And of course, in Christ's death, we see the blood and the water come pouring out in John 19.34. But the questions are asked in Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Friends, the blood of Jesus Christ is what justifies and cleanses us of our sins and puts us in a right relationship with God. It's baptism that we appropriate that blood. Back to you, Dan. Thank you uh, very much there, Chris. You know, I was at a business the other day in Longview, Texas, and uh, I started to go to the door that I had normally gone to, but I found that it was shut up. It had been, uh, plywood had been placed over and it had been nailed shut. And it said, go around the other way. 
You know, when you read the Bible, you understand that there is one way, and every other door has been closed. Now, we're going to call on uh, Carrie Clark to help us understand that. Isn't that true, Carrie? Dan, you're absolutely right. When uh, Jesus died on the cross, that closed every other way to access the Father. I want you to listen as we read from Acts chapter 4. I'd like to begin our reading in verse number 10. The Bible says, Be it known unto you all, and all the people of Israel, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. Peter says, This is the stone which would set it not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now listen carefully to Acts 4 and verse 12, the words of Peter. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. We sing a song, it's called The Way of the Cross, and we sing The Way of the Cross Leads Home. That song is absolutely right. As a matter of fact, that song says, I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. He says, I'll ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. Jesus tells us in John chapter 14 and verse number 6, Jesus said, I am the way. That's exclusive. He is the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the life and the truth. No man goes to the Father but by Him. And so when we look at this, we find that Jesus closed every other way. Now there are people in this world today that will claim there's a lot of different ways for us to get to Jesus Christ. Uh, they will say we can get through to Jesus Christ through denominationalism or Islam or some other uh, form of religion, but the Bible is clear. The only way to God today is through Jesus Christ. And when we think about that, we need to remember that in Ephesians chapter 4, and I'd like to begin our reading in verse number 4 where the Bible says, There is one body, there is one spirit, even as we are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. There is one body. And Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, that body is the church. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Carrie, thank you so much for that explanation, and we're grateful for you being on the telecast this morning. You know, we began and we initiated this program by talking about the faithfulness of God and how that cross and those nails uh, brought together the faithfulness of God to all of us. But surely that was motivated by the love of God. And uh, certainly the Bible teaches that when those nails were driven through the hands of Jesus, they nailed down the love of Almighty God. And we want to go right now to Dora Bruce to help us be reminded of that. How great the Father's love for us. In the world we live in, there's so much misconception or a lack of understanding of how wonderful love truly is. As a matter of fact, you'll have a young couple as they look into each other's eyes and say, I love you. And only moments later, then they're, they're, they become empty words. God's love for us. How great and awesome is this love. When asked, how much did Jesus love you? He stretched out his hands and said this much as he was nailed to the cross. In Romans chapter number 5, in verses 8 through 9, we find described God through his son Jesus Christ demonstrating his love for us. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we weren't worthy at all, when we were separated, God showed his love for us as individuals by allowing his son to be nailed upon that cross or him dying for us. Verse number nine, much more then, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 
we have salvation. We have the hope that our sins are washed away, that we can be right with Him because Jesus showed His love by being nailed to the cross. There's so many things in this world that distract us from His love, whether it be illness, physical illness, or, or perhaps sin that we allow to get in our lives to separate us from Him, or, or perhaps there's grief over lost ones who, that we love or concerned for have lost, or, or pain, or, or even those who are unkind to us. All these things, none of these things should we allow for us to lose sight of the love of God. You think of Jesus as He was about to be taken to die on the cross. There in the, the garden He prayed, and He prayed fervently. And you think of all the grief and the hurt and the pain and the struggle that He was going through. He prayed there in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39. He went a little further and fell to His face and prayed, O oh Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He knew where to turn. It's to God we must turn. God's promise in uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 through 6, let your conduct be without covetous. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? God looks into our eyes and says, I love you and nail the sun upon the cross. Thank you. Thank you, Doyle. You know, we all ought to be eternally thankful and grateful unto God for all the good things of life, and certainly for our Lord's willingness to go to the cross to die for our sins. And because of His death upon the cross, He nailed down something else that's so important and something that we often forget. And we're going to call on Chris Vidakovich right now to help us understand what that is. You know, Dan, there's this great promise that we have in John chapter 14, and all of us are very familiar with it in one translation or another and one understanding of another. But I think sometimes we miss out the greatest promise that was nailed to the cross, and that's this. Listen carefully. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and I prepare a place for you. And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you can be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And then Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know how to get, how, uh, we don't know the way. And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know me, and you have seen me. The great promise there is, yes, there's this home in heaven, and that home in heaven has been nailed down for those who are faithful to Christ. But part of the greatest promise of that is, it's the way to the Father as well. It's the way to be with God for all of an eternity. There's no other way that we can be with God for all of an eternity except through the cross and through Jesus dying for our sins, being that sacrifice on the cross. So isn't it wonderful that now we know the way, and that way is Jesus. The way is the cross. That's what leads us home. In Revelation chapter 21, we get this great picture of the cross, this great description of heaven. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God, a place prepared as a beautiful bride dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Isn't it wonderful that when Jesus died on the cross, he nailed down a home in heaven for the faithful. He nailed down a home with God. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus says to the church, Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you a crown of life. So we want to go to heaven. We want to be with God for all of an eternity. Well, it's been nailed down. We actually have the hope. John says, I write these things to you, believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. Do you know it? Are you certain that you're going to be resurrected with Him, as, as uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 5 says? 
it's been nailed down for you, but will you accept the cross so that you can have the way home, the way to God? Dan? Chris, that hope of heaven can be so real to all of us, and so we're so thankful this morning and grateful for that wonderful promise. You know, this coming Thursday, our world will pause to reflect upon the cross and perhaps the nails, but the one we should really be thankful for is the one who died upon the cross, and that's our Lord Jesus. This coming Thursday is what we traditionally call Thanksgiving Day. Wouldn't it be wonderful for you to pause and s simply think about the death of Jesus upon the cross and be eternally thankful for God's love, for all the wonderful blessings of life, the blessings that you enjoy throughout this year, the blessing of being an American, the blessing of being able to follow Christ in baptism and to become a New Testament Christian. Thanksgiving. You know, the Bible says that in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And even Jesus our Lord had something to say about that. He did in Luke 18, for he said that men ought always pray and faint not, always be grateful. He told a parable one time about Thanksgiving about 10 lepers, nine, nine of them walked away without ever giving thanks for their healing, and only one returned, and Jesus took note of it. He takes note of your gratitude to even today. Be thankful for him. I'm Dan Manuel, joining all of our panelists, saying thank you for being a part of our telecast today. From the land which needs no sun or moon Nor ever darkness knows And radiant with the living splendor Makes the way so bright You can walk, you can walk Safely walk, safely walk On the upward path of right oh. Walk, walk, walk in the light of God In the glory Come in peace, in the perfect light of God. 